In the book of John, chapter 18, verse 36, he told Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not of this world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 and 29, it says, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Now, some believers will have positions of leadership and roles esteemed by society, and they should use those for the glory of God. Others will have normal lives, perhaps uh, of seemingly small influence in the present, but yet it is still influential for you, whether it be on your job, on a bus, on the train, in the park, at the gym, to represent Christ and be his image in the earth. Recall what Jesus did, uh, or rather what he even did not do. He did not spread his message through kings, but through a group of 12 men and others who had followed him. Now here is some more of Professor Wallace. I sat down with Lance Wall now. I said to him at one point, what I heard, because I spent an entire day at this tent revival event mm -hmm. he sponsored in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, I said, would I be wrong if I told you that I heard references to people who were their political opponents as demons or devils? He said, no, you heard that right. And I said, well, help me understand that from your perspective. And he said, the devil takes possession of people, speaks through them, and essentially that's what's happened to people who occupy the left side of the American political spectrum or who call themselves Democrats in certain respects. Evaluate that for, for me. It's bad theology. It's just simply bad theology. Not just bad politics. It's bad theology. So this lawyer uh, in the Luke text of the Good Samaritan parable comes to Jesus to ask a question. Uh, I've dug deep into this text and I learned it's a Washington lawyer. <laughs> I, I know that tone of voice. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, I think you know. You've read the text. It's in the law. You love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then you love your neighbor as yourself. This is a powerful story. Then he says, he asked Jesus the most important question for a democracy. Who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That's what you're getting at here. Who is my neighbor? Particularly as we move toward a multiracial democracy, this is the question. Who is my neighbor? So Jesus answers him by telling the story, this parable. Jesus told stories called parables. And he lifts up this Samaritan. Uh, now, in the Judean culture where Jesus was speaking, there were no good Samaritans. They were mixed race. They were called half-breeds. They were dangerous, despised. Maybe they were bringing cartels from Mexico with drugs. And, oh, no, that's a different group. But they're othered like we're othering people today. So here is an other, and the man alongside the road I've checked with Jewish scholars is a Jewish man. So here's a Samaritan who is, mon who is othered by his society, helping one who's other to him along the way. That's a powerful message. So who is my neighbor? The question asks of Jesus. Jesus says, well, probably the one who's different than you. Your neighbor Maybe most might, different from you. Most different. M m probably lives outside your neighborhood. That's the p powerful story of the parable. So who is my neighbor is the question I want to ask. And to make it just us, people like us, who look like us, uh, that's, that's really a distorted reading 
of, uh, of the text. And the gospel is really saying your neighbor is probably the one who's different than you. And these lies. Jesus also said, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free, right? Every crowd of people I talked to, they said, free. Mm -hmm. As you look at that text, to me it means the opposite of of truth-telling is not just lies, it's captivity. Captivity. And so truth and, and freedom are indivisible. So a whole lot of people are captive to these lies that are being told. So it's not like they're just bad people, but they're captive to the lies that Donald Trump is telling. The 7 a mandate is an authoritative model of leading that celebrates taking dominion from the high place to set the agenda that forms nations and society. But Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 20, 25, 27, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to be great or become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. The meaning of the Greek word translated as lord it over can be translated as exercise dominion over, overcome or exercise lordship over. The goal for many who adhere to this teaching often becomes to seize the seat of power and force what they think the kingdom of God should look like in their mountain of influence. One of the greatest challenges to the 7M theology is the life and teachings of Jesus himself. He was born into a world desperately looking for a political leader, yet he firmly stated that he was not that leader. If the understanding of cultural mounteering, so to speak, and, and political takeover was foundational to the kingdom of God coming, don't you think Jesus would have given us a different model to follow? In John chapter 6, verse 15, he says, Therefore, when Jesus perceived that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he departed again to the mountain by himself alone. Here we see the only mountain Jesus scale was to pray and remove himself from those who were trying to force him to take power through political force. Digging deeper and, and thinking about the metaphors Jesus used to talk about change and transformation, they were about inside out transformation, not power over dominion. And finally, at the end of Jesus's life, when he stood before Pilate, he could not have been more clear about the nature and how God's kingdom come and even how it came. In John 18, 36, he declared, my kingdom, sovereignty and, and the royal power is not derived from this world or its inhabitants. Listen, it is not derived from this world or its inhabitants. My kingdom, if my kingdom were, were of this world, my servants would fight so that I would not be delivered to the Jews. But now my kingdom is not sourced from this realm. Now, Jesus understood that politics and policy don't change people hard. Trying to manipulate and legislate Fallible human interpretation of what is believed to be God's will is nothing less than demanding a spiritualized version of our own uh, uh, understanding rooted in our own strength. Jesus proclaimed that God's kingdom was not only coming, but was already here, meaning it is both present and future. 
And he does not indicate that the kingdom of God would be determined by cultural domination, political power, or social esteem. Uh, reading what they said, I couldn't believe this. I want to quote it right. Uh, we are preparing for war. Uh, I am not on this earth to be blessed, but to be armed and dangerous. Followers of Jesus are not thought to be the ones who are armed and dangerous. Your point, Gene, they are ignoring the teaching of Jesus. So rather than have a political argument, I try, I'm in, on the road all the time now with these people. I'm saying, let's talk about what Jesus said and what he did. Uh, and we are called to be peacemakers, conflict resolvers, not conflict creators. These people are conflict creators. They had Jesus flags in the Capitol as they were beating police. So this is a movement that's gone afar from the teaching of Jesus. The good news is there's a new movement afoot, really an old movement. I see diverse Christians and others all around the country who are confronting and countering this white Christian nationalist movement with the teaching of Jesus. To your point, it is white Christian nationalism versus Jesus Christ. And the more we frame it right. that way, uh, the better conversation we're going to have. Joe, that's the heart of this issue. It's a movement for power, using religion, abusing religion to gain political power. Uh, one of the temptations of Jesus was Satan said, mm -hmm. I will give you the world. <laughs> Here, here's the world. I'll give it to you if you bow down and worship me. And they've done that now. They're going for power. It's the old Joe, as you know, the dominionist theology. Christians should have dominion, control, and power. And so I think this is a moment to bring people back to what you call the red letters of Jesus. They're ignoring the teaching of Jesus. So I want to have this conversation, this debate, if you will, around the country for this, this next month. What did Jesus say and what did he do? And I think a lot of Christians are going to, uh, they, they want to know what Jesus said. And yet mm -hmm. these people are using religion and their version of it to gain power. And so that power is, in fact, what they're about. And Jesus says, I've come to bring you a different way. Love your neighbor. Love your enemies. And she said, this is what Jesus said. So maybe this could be a moment where we actually come back to Jesus in the churches. A major issue for me with this mandate is that there is no real, no real scriptural support for it. Now, there are two scriptures used to support the mandate. Uh, uh, that I even used at, uh, in the past. But I understand now that they were taken out of context. One is Isaiah chapter 2, verse 2. And it says, It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be firmly established as the highest of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Now, this scripture refers to last days. It expresses the certainty of what God will do and the urgency of present readiness. Mythologically, mountains were the homes of the gods. Historically, the Lord chose Mount Zion. Eschologically, the whole earth will be the Lord's mountain. Therefore, Isaiah speaks uh, here of the Lord's house, not the temple, because a temple is primarily a place for worship, whereas a house is primar primarily where the Lord has come to live among his people, according to Exodus 29, 42 through 46. Now, if we go one more verse down to verse three, we find this, and many people shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and instructions, 
and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Now, the word come, jumped out at me and begged me to pay attention to it. <laughs> come is, is used to correct, to reassure or urge someone on. Then urge wanted some attention, which I honored. <laughs> and I started looking at urge, and urge has multiple meanings as a verb and as a noun. As a verb, it means to strongly encourage, to ask for, or support something. As a noun, it expresses a strong desire, especially one that is difficult to control or almost a compulsion. Now, many words relate to urge, such as urgent, pressing, encourage, uh, nudge, exhort, prompt, uh, spur, and many more. None of which refer to forcing, punishing, or threatening. People are being invited to the mountain of God, not forced from a position of being subjected or dominated. And though people are drawn supernaturally, they come voluntarily. Their agreement, you found in the words, come let us, in seeking the Lord, nullifies nationalism. Something makes them willing to seek the God of Jacob. That something, namely, is a hunger for revealed truth. So they come to learn, they come to obey, and they come to receive what cannot be had or obtained elsewhere. Let's look at Matthew 28, uh, verses 19, 20. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. Jesus left the disciples with some last words of instruction. God gave Jesus complete authority over heaven and earth. So on the basis of his authority, Jesus told his disciples to go and make disciples as they preached, baptized, and taught. Making disciples means instructing new believers on how to follow Jesus, how to submit to the, his lordship and how to take up his mission of compassionate service. Baptizing is important because it unites a believer with Jesus Christ in his or her death to sin and resurrection to new life. Baptism symbolizes a submission to Christ, a willingness to live God's way and uh, identification with God's covenant people. This is the path, this is the avenue, this is the, the way we are to express, we are to influence, we are to engage in the culture that God has placed us in at a particular time and season. It's not a time for forced dominion over people to try to force them to, to accept our way of belief in God and Jesus Christ. This is not God's way. This was not Jesus' way. And it should not be the way of those of us who consider ourselves followers of, and believers of Jesus Christ and citizens of the kingdom of God. What say you? I hope you enjoyed the ride today. Please, uh, Take a minute to hit the subscribe button and notification button so you can be informed when new posts come up and revisit our channel for more engaging and enlightening videos. And if you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, click on the button above labeled Prayer of Salvation or in the link below in the description section. Otherwise, thank you for spending some of your time with me and as always, peace and blessing to you and your household.